Okay, good evening. Welcome to the Torah studies. Matois Masse is the portion that we read this week. The two portions. And we complete the book of Bamidbar. We say Chazak, Chazak, Vinit Chazak. It is Shabbos Chazak. And the topic today is a very, not only important topic, but it is, is an, a new understanding in, in a way we can say even a revolutionary understanding, the way the Rebbe teaches us to look at our mistakes and our failings, our sins, even willful sins that were people make. And that in the end of the day, it is all a plan and part of the master plan of Hashem. Shouldn't take it in the wrong way, of course. We shouldn't think, chas v'chalile, God forbid, that it is in any way okay to sin. But what we're going to explain is that ultimately, after the fact that a person did make mistakes, we can realize and see and look back and see how this helped us. Because ultimately, God, whatever Hashem wants is to the good. And so this helps us to grow. And that's what the purpose of this is, to be able to take it in the right way. And we begin with the story, with the second portion that we read the second of the two that we read this week. It begins with the journeys of the Jewish people. The Mas'ei B'nai Israel, the journeys that we had throughout the 40 years in the desert. So, I'm going to share. I'm going to see inside. Okay, there we go. So, the question for discussion. Are humans the glaring exception to God's otherwise perfect universe? You see, Hashem created the universe, everything is perfect. Everything works in sync with God's plan. The animals, the trees, the waters, everything, everything works in God's plan except for humans. We mess up. We keep messing up. So the question is, do we undermine God's plan by messing up? So, as we said before, we're going to look the way the Rebbe sees those things. The way the Rebbe teaches us how we are to look even and the uh, mistakes that we do. So we begin with the second portion that we are going to read this Shabbos, the portion of Mas'e. So it says, Eile Mas'e B'nei Israel. These are the journeys of the children of Israel who left the land of Egypt in their legions under the charge of Moses and Aaron. Moses recorded their starting points for the journeys according to the word of God. And these were the journeys with their starting points. Motzeem lemaseem. They journeyed from Ramses in the first month on the 15th day of the first month, on the day following the Passover sacrifice. The children of Israel left triumphantly before the eyes of the Egyptians. Why do we have these journeys? Why does the Torah repeat these journeys at the end, before the Jews were about to enter Israel, they finished the journeys? Why does the Torah repeat those journeys? 
So here there is a medrash that explains and it says as follows. Marshal Amelech Shaya Benochole. It is analogous. I'm sorry, it is analogous to a king whose son became sick. So he took him to a far away place to have him healed. On the way back, the father began citing all the stages of their journey, saying to him, this is where we sat. Here we were called. And here you had a headache. So too, God instructed Moses to list all the places the Jewish people angered God. Thus, it is stated, these are the journeys. Okay. The question is, this is, the whole thing is really strange. Why? Why would God tell Moses to tell the Jewish people? We're talking about 39 years later. The Jews, okay, they had a very terrible journey. So many mistakes, so many problems, so many um, rebellions, sinning, the golden calf, all kind of problems that they had throughout these 40 years. We're past that. We had it, we journeyed, we had the ups and downs. Now we are about to enter the land of Israel. God says, Moses, go back and tell them all the journeys, everything what, what happened. Why mention those, all of this? Why can't we put those things in the past and move on? Now we are entering the Holy Land. This is a new generation now. Mention now your fathers, what they, what they journeyed, what they, the mistakes that they made, the problems. Why? These are the, these are, this is the, the questions. Okay? So why go back and recount the mistakes in the desert? Why bring up trauma now that it's at a closing point? So to understand this, we first need to explain some, a little deeper, what is the journey all about? What were the journeys? The journeys that the Jewish people did in the desert, the Alta Rebbe, Rabbi Shneer Zalman says in the Lakut Etera, he gives a whole deeper explanation. He says these two, 42 journeys that the Jewish people traveled in the desert, this is, this is a cosmic journey that the people travel, the Jewish people travel throughout the history. That means it's a spiritual journey that we take and the journey that the Jews had for 40 years in the desert, this was like the pathway that guided us and prepared us to this spiritual journey. As the al says in Lekot it says, what was the purpose of the 42 journeys in the desert? All journeys pointed to Jericho. The desert through which the Jews traveled is called the desert of the nations, Midbar Ha'amim, about which it is stated, stated God led you through that great and awesome desert, Amidbar Agodol Ve'anora, Nachash Sarah Ve'akrov, in which there were snakes, vipers, and scorpions, namely an evil place where all negative forces feed. Now, the 42 journeys were so that those who hate him flee from before him, namely, to cut off all vitality from the negative forces. This was achieved by the Jews who were created in God's image, in the image of God, traveling about the desert. So when the Jews travel about the desert, it was all about this spiritual journey. 
when they acted there, the, the mitzvahs in the desert, it was a spiritual eradicating of the evil. The primary purpose of their journey was to leave Egypt, namely any sort of constraint. Egypt in Hebrew is Mitzrayim. Mitzrayim means constraint. constraint. They need to leave their constraint to go become free of their own limitations and do the right thing. Thus, all the journeys are considered to be a journey out of Egypt until they finally reached Jericho, which represented, represents the Messianic era. So this is the journey of history. Jericho represented a Messianic era about which it is stated, and he shall be animated by the fear of God. And neither with the sight of his eyes shall he judge, nor with the hearing of his ears shall he chastise. Tradition has it that Mashiach will judge with his sense of smell, reyach, aligned with the notion of Yericho. Okay, so this is basically, this is basically the journeys, the way the Alter Rebbe explains. That Hashem says to Moshe Rabbeinu, tell the Jewish people the journeys. I want you to see the ups and the downs in the journey so we can learn, so we can take this as we continue this journey towards the coming of Mashiach. And the Rebbe further explains this. That's in text number three. Says the Rebbe, by definition, the soul's journeys, journey through the desert of this world involved a dramatic plunge from the greatest heights to the absolute nadir, a place of utter godly concealment. That is the soul's journey. Neshama, as we learned in the Tanya these days, it comes from a very high place and it comes down to this physical, low, material world where godliness is concealed. While it's true that the purpose of this plunge is for the heights, the height to which it will eventually reach, the reality is that during the journey, it very much feels like a downfall. It is only that thereby, and later on, one reaches greater heights. Says the Rebbe, now when does it feel this way? During the journey. Of course. When one finally reaches the mountaintop, they are able to see the true purpose of the exile, the law that it was really nothing else other than a part of the of climbing up. So basically, this is the answer why Hashem tells Moshe to look back at the journeys. He tells him, you were journeying through the desert. There was ups and there was downs and there was falls. I want you to see it retroactively to see how these journeys elevated you. These, these falls elevated you, and that keeps us to understand that this is the way it is in the journey of life. Now we look back at the, at the times when we had the falls, and we see how those, even the falls, are part of the going up. It says, this then is the idea of the analogy that describes how on the way back, the father began citing all the stages of the journey after the plunge down and through the 42 journeys be it begins the process of going back and climbing up. That means re retracting one step along 
one's steps along the very same journey and appreciating how those downfalls were really part of the, of the climb up. Thus, God says, list all the places the Jewish people angered me. With proper framing, we will thank God for the challenges. For we, we will understand how they were truly a form of kindness to bring us higher. Okay, so this is the answer. Right before entering the Holy Land, a positive place, it was time to reframe past events and realize how they were part of the journey. However, we have a question here. This explains all the challenges that we have. Challenges can come, different types of challenges come from above. It's not really in our hands. And when we face those challenges, we say, yes, it is indeed a, a challenge. It is a difficult time that we have to go through, a difficult challenge. And going through those challenges will make us stronger. However, this doesn't explain the, different ty the other types of falling. The falling that is really not up to God, but is up to us. When a person on his own choice makes a mistake or willingly commits a sin. Can we say that this is also part of the plan? I mean, this is your choice. When the Jewish people had their own failings in the desert, when they decided to worship the idol, the golden calf, the sin of the spies, all of these things, how can we look at those things are those things also part of God's plan at the end of the day this is something that it was the choice of people and this is the question the Rebbe is asking in the next text says the Rebbe one can understand that in as much as the overall plunge into the wilderness of the desert is set up in advance by God, it is ultimately render the kindness and part of climb up, part of the climb up. But those times that the Jews angered God in the desert, it were a result of the Jews wanting sins. In other words, the Jews set in motion a downfall beyond what was ordained from on high. What then compels us to argue that they too are part of the climb up? The answer in short, says the Rebbe, that the answer is yes. The answer is yes. Even those sins that it is our choice and we make those mistakes and the end of the day, there is God's hand in there too. It is a very a revolutionary idea in a sense. But we need first to explain why do we commit sins? You know, we make mistakes. We always, everybody makes mistakes. We regret those mistakes. Some mistakes are bigger, some mistakes are smaller. Some have more severe consequences. You missed your son's uh, uh, soccer game and you regret it to say, why did I do this? He's gonna feel bad. You spend your weight, your savings in gambling and you regret it. You can all, always make mistakes and we regret those mistakes. And who's at fault? Obviously 
it is no one to blame but ourselves. We have to think what we are doing. We have to take responsibility to what, to what we're doing. But the question is, does God have a role in it as well? Is it something that we can, can he take a little bit of the blame? So here is an interesting medrash. The medrash and the verse in the Genesis is a verse, famous verse. The Torah says, Vayomer Alekim Nase Adam Betzalmeinu Kidmoteinu. God said, Let us make man in our image and likeness. That verse is famous for what? For these words. Let us. Let us make man. Yes, this was a verse that caused many to understand the Torah in a wrong way. To, to do terrible, terrible mistakes. As the Medrash tells us, says when Moses transcribed the Torah, he dutifully rec recorded God's acts of creation on each of the six of the first six days, when he reached the verse and God said, let us make man in our image and likeness, he was mortified. And Moses says to God, master of the universe, he protested, why are you providing an argument for heretics? That the heretics will say there is more than one God. Let us. God responded, just write it. Whoever seeks to err is free to do so. You write, if though anyone wants to make a mistake, let him make a mistake. This was, this was obviously the, the, the mistake that the Christians make. They base it on this verse, let us make that is, that is more than one deity, chas v'shalom, God forbid. And God gave him the room to, miss, to make a mistake. He gave us the room to make mistakes. And the question is why? Yes, there's answers why God, Rashi explains why God in this particular verse said it led us to teach us how we should be humbled, we should share, even if you're in charge, you should uh, uh, consult with people below you. And yes, but, but God could teach us in, the, in other ways. Why may allow this, making this mistake? We see the same thing, the first sin that caused, uh, that was uh, done, done by Adam and Eve. God creates Adam and Eve. And he, he, he warns them not to eat from the tree. You can eat from any other tree except from this tree. Me'etz, Adat, the tree of knowledge, do not eat. What does he do the next thing? He sends the Nachash, the serpent, to go and seduce them, to go and induce them to do exactly what he said not to do. So Hashem said, sent the snake, obviously. The snake came. Who allowed the snake to come to Adam and Chava? Hashem did this. Why does Hashem do it? So here, the Rebbe gives us the answer here. We'll look at it in the next text. Says the Rebbe, any deterioration that society or an individual experiences as a result of human activity and the irresponsible exercise of free choice is ultimately in accordance with God's plan. Very strong words. This is God's plan. It's not that this is God's will. This is God's plan. And therefore, 
must also lead to a productive goal. In fact, these deteriorations are part and parcel of God's productive goal. True, a sinful act is absolutely contrary to God's will. However, its result, the decline in society's moral, moral standing, or in an individual, does not contradict his will. Consequently, the decline is not a genuine descent, but rather a necessary component of the ascent to which it leads. If to let it sink in. It's a very, very strong statement. The sin is something part of God's plan. Now, to be clear, obviously, no one should take this as a license to go and commit sin. God forbid, that's against the will of God. But at the end of the day, at the end of the day, it is, if this is an option that God gave us and put in front of us, and we failed, we have to see what is the good that comes out of it, because ultimately, it was God that put the test in front of us. Ultimately, God is teva hatov le'etiv, is the nature of doing good and only good. As the Rebbe continues, okay, although we are accountable for our bad choices, God allows for the possibility because of the greater ascent that will result. Says the Rebbe, God is the paragon of goodness. Teva atov leti. And it is the nature of one who is good to always bestow goodness. Therefore, in as much as God is the one who enables the deterioration, we must conclude that no alternative past exists to arrive at an ascent of this magnitude. For had there been an easier or better path, one that avoids suffering and lapses, why would God provide a more difficult route? So, so it is choices that God gives us. It is the choices that God gives us but ultimately, it is for the benefit. Think about parents that train a child, the, the child, the toddler to walk. When they train him to walk, they let him fall. And the child falls. And the, you let him run in the backyard and he falls and he scrapes himself. But the falling will help him to learn how to walk. So obviously, if a, if a parent sees that a certain thing with the child would not be able to survive, he's not going to allow him to do, he's not going to allow him to run in, 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 in the street, the middle of the street, in, a, in the traffic. If a parent, if let's say you have People have, a gun, have guns, they're not going to give a child a gun to shoot if the child, if there is a doubt that the child is capable of handling a gun. So this is the same thing. Hashem gives us these choices and these choices are there so we can overcome them. And if we fall, we can get up. And when we get up, we reach we, be, we become even stronger. So the sins 
going back to the story in the desert. The story in the desert, the Medrash tells us, as we said, read before, as the king holds the son, the king that takes the son to be cured and he comes back and he tells him, remember here you were sick and here you didn't feel good, you had your headache, headache which represents the, the fallings of the son. But all throughout the way, the king was holding him. So Hashem was there even during the, the, the time of the falling. Says the Rebbe, the truth is that the reason why a person can sometimes make the mistake to listen to the Yetzirah, the evil inclination, and stumble into sin is because the Yetzirah has been dispatched from on high to tempt them to sin. It emerges that even those laws resulting from sin are also part of the master plan to bring one to teshuva that introduces even greater lights, greater light through the process of transforming sin into merits. That is why the Torah says, say, that is why Moshe gives them the list of all these journeys to teach them how it was all of this, even the bad things, even the falls was for a good reason. This too is the Medrash, the Medrash parable. The father points out, here you caused your head to hurt. Chashta the Hebrew says. You caused your head to hurt. As the Rebbe explains, this was when the Jews, what does it mean, caused your head to hurt? When the Jews complained, let us go back to Egypt. Even in a situation that the prince brings about his own malady, with his own bad choices, it isn't really only the son's doing, rather it, rather it is part of the healing journey through which the king escorts him. Thus, it is abundantly clear that the purpose of the melody is not just so that the sun can reach the plateau of one who is healed, rather much greater heights, namely retroactively rendering his sins as merits. That's what it says. About teshuva, when a person does teshuva, the sins is considered merits. So all the journeys in the desert, even the negative, were part of the subsequent aliyah, the, the ascent. This explains why it was worth rehashing just before entering the promised land to take stock and remind us how to look at every part of life, sins included. Even the sins are part of the journey. So the question is, what is the nature of the Aliyah that comes about only through Yerida? So basically we come here to conclusion that there is something there is some aliyah and ascent that can only come through falling. What is it? What gains have you occurred from failure in your life? You can ask yourself that same question. So there's the famous Talmud that tells us in the place where penitents stand, even the perfectly righteous cannot stand. The Alter Rebbe explains this. Why is it that in this, in this place of Abal Tshuva, the Tzaddik cannot go? We learned this in Tanya, that this is the Baal Tshuva has this drive. It has this force that a tzaddik doesn't have. 
A tzaddik is going on a smooth ride, sailing on cruise control towards the heights, towards the Beis Amikdash, towards the good things. The Baal Tshuva, the person who committed the sin, the sin itself, reaches the person, gets the person to the drive, the force to be able to do the right thing in much, much more forceful way. And this is something that we find also, as the Rebbe explains, the luchis, the, the tablets that was given to the Jewish people. We were given the first tablets. Then there was a stage when the Jewish people committed the sin of the golden calf and the tablets were broken. The people did teshuva, repented. And then God gave Moses a second set of tablets. And there is something that they can get. There's a point where they can get only through going through the, the problems. Why? Because then when they go through the sin, when they fail and they make a mistake, how many times do we say sometimes, you know, I can't believe it, I did this mistake. It, I, I was I just wasn't myself. I wasn't myself. We say that, what does it mean you weren't yourself? You weren't yourself. That, that means that when you realize after you make the mistake, you realize that this wasn't really who you are or who you, sh you should be. In other words, after making a mistake, the choosing the right thing is not something that you choose only because you were told so by God. It is now a choice that you make because you appreciate that this is the right thing. Teshuva is turning bad experience into merits. The failure to retroactively redefine, the fa failure is retroactively redefined. And now a positive influence in the person's life. So the sin itself becomes a positive influence. And here says the Rebbe, the first stage in is revelation from above which is ultimately beyond us and cannot become fully integrated with our reality. This friction allows for a possible implosion. By contrast, the second tablets were earned through human effort, our teshuva, and crafted by Moses, not God. They were therefore suitable vehicles for the practical realization of God's ultimate plan. So mistakes are a departure from our real selves. Teshuva is to discover that serving God is actually what I want to do. It's, it's not just something that God wants me to do. It is something that I want to do. And God's congratulating Moses for breaking the first tablets is alluded to in the Torah in instruction to Moses to fashion the second tablets. For it was only at that point that the advantage that the Jews gained through the shattering of the first tablets became apparent. You see, when we make the mistakes, sometimes it's, it, we, we become so involved in this. We repeat the mistakes and it becomes almost like, like, uh, like, like it's, uh, it's okay. You know, they say this guy goes in, uh, he goes into the bar, sitting, the bartender giving him a, 
a mug of beer. He sits there and he takes the mug and he splashes it straight into his face. The bartender is so angry, frustrated. He screams at him. How dare you? Are you crazy? This he says, apologize, apologize. I don't know what happens to me. I, I have this impulse and I feel so guilty. I have, I don't know why I did it. So he feels bad for him. He tells him, listen, I know a good psychologist. Go talk to him. It'll help you. So gives him the address, gives him the point, and he goes there. And after a few treatments, he comes back. After two months, comes back to the same bar, he sits at the bar, orders a beer, he sits and drinks, and he takes the beer straight into his face. Panta is furious. What, didn't you go to the psychologist that I sent you? He said, yes, of course I did. Didn't he help you? Yes, of course he helped me. Now I don't feel guilty anymore. So sometimes we do the sins and we repeat them and we start feeling guilty about those things anymore. And the question is, how do we get out of this? Here comes the rabbi. Talmud says, Ravuna said, when a person transgresses and repeats it a second time, it becomes permissible for him. Now, do you really think that the deed became, becomes permissible? Rather, he means that it becomes permissible in the eyes of the offender. So once we comprehend the shattering of awful reality of a mistake, we can redefine the bad choice into a positive influence. So why is it always harder to make the right choice? Specifically when we, it comes to areas where we have failed in the past. We repeat those mistakes. Comes the Rebbe gives us a very powerful message. We must never despair, God forbid. Regardless of our personal state, this holds true even if our spiritual state is abjectly low and truly wrenched. And even if we made irresponsible choices and are fully to blame for bringing this miserable state of affairs upon ourselves. True, a sinner ought to wail and bemoan his transgressions and the evil that he has wrought his soul. But at the same time, we must never lose hope of a brighter future. Rather, we must realize that although we cause this mess with our own free choice, it is simultaneously part of the divine plan. Clearly then, it will lead us through Advocate Teshuvah to far greater heights than would otherwise have been possible. So the Rebbe, the, the Gansa Indian, the, the sole purpose for which God created the possibility for sin is to enable us to arrive at the superior level of the Baal Teshuvah, the penitent. The entire function of sin is to create a possibility for a person to become banished from God's closeness, but with the ex expressed objective that the banished will not remain banished from him. What does it mean? There is a verse that says in Samuel, Le yidach nidach. that there were, yes, a person who commits sin can be banished, but ultimately we become the one who will not be banished, that the banished will, will not remain banished from him. We can therefore appreciate the ability for, of Teshuvah to correct our past failings for the concept of sin was originally created only to serve as a facilitator 
for the advantage gained through Teshuvah. For the very purpose of life's difficulties and the point of our failures is to bring about a greater good. We make mistakes, yes, mistakes ought to bother, bother us, but mistakes should not define us. Shouldn't fall in despair, think that this is what it is. On the contrary, everything that happens in pa in par is part of God's plan. The lower we reach, the higher we can potentially climb. Your mistake was bad, but the process it brings is good. So go ahead and make it that way. So we we'll, we'll learn a, a tremendous lesson from this class. What do we understand? That no matter what level we fall, we shouldn't miss the point. We are not followers or failures. We are simply learning how to walk and how to grow. I'm sure there is questions here tonight. This, this is a very um, a concept to take with, that we really needs to sink in to appreciate. And, and it's a very fine line. We shouldn't make a mistake. It's a very fine line between saying it's okay, it's God's plan, and saying, no, it's not okay. We shouldn't go there. But if it happened, we should see how God wanted us to, to happen and how we can grow and become stronger from this. Thank you so much for joining and uh, we'll take our questions. Don't forget to share this and subscribe.